Okay. Welcome everybody. I, my name is Rebecca Murray. I am a lecturer in sociological studies at the University of Sheffield, the Department of Sociological Studies, and I'm also project manager for the MRG. I will be chairing today's seminar. Um, before we start, I'd just like to advise you that we will be recording the seminar, to, just to let you all know that from the outset. Okay, so this is the this is the penultimate seminar in the this semester's series of virtual online events. Um, today we are joined by Dr. Sabina Little from the School of Education and Megan Greenwood from Schools of Sanctuary. Before I introduce our speakers, uh, our speaker and our discussant in, in more detail, I'd just like to highlight um, that this isn't actually the final seminar in the series, it is the penultimate event. We have added an additional event that will take place at the same time next week on the 16th of December, um, during which we will hear from Dr. Marta Petrzynska, who is an academic and border activist based at the University of Warsaw, who will be reporting on the current humanitarian crisis that is taking place on the border between um, Poland and Belarus. So if you um, check the MRG website um, and Twitter, we have full details and um, where you can register register for the event and uh, yeah please we would encourage you to come and join us next week for the last seminar in the series um, okay so back to today's session it gives me great pleasure to introduce first of all dr sabina little who is a senior lecturer in language languages education at the university of sheffield um, sabina's research focuses on the relationship between language identity and belonging and her research takes place within families, schools, and the wider community. Sabina is particularly interested in improving the ways in which children's multilingual identities are valued and recognised at formal education and societal levels. Her work on um, Sheffield's Multilingual Children's Library actually won an award, and the Brenda Eastwood Award for Diversity and Inclusion, and her current project, Lost Worlds, which you can find um, under multilingualisminschools.net, aims to give teachers the tools to support multilingual pupils holistically within the classroom. Um, I had the pleasure of working on the Lost Worlds project with Sabina over the course of a year and working on impact with her, so I can, I'm looking forward to hearing more, more about how the project's developed today. Um, so after Sabina, Sabina is joined today, we're joined by Megan Greenwood from the Schools of Sanctuary discussant. Um, Megan is the School of Sanctuary Support Officer, which is part of the wider City of Sanctuary movement. Okay, Megan has um, previously worked in the formal and non-formal education sectors in the UK and abroad and has recently graduated with an Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's Degree in Education Policies for Global Development. Um, Megan specialises in education for young people from refugee and migrant backgrounds. Just a quick word about the School of Sanctuary. So the School of Sanctuary is a, is a growing network of more than 330 primary and secondary schools, all of whom are committed to providing support to thousands of young people who seek sanctuary in the UK in order to create a culture of welcome and inclusion for everyone within primary and secondary school. Okay, so before I hand over to Sabina to begin her presentation, I'd like to quickly run through the format for today's seminar. We will start by hearing from our speaker, Sabina, and I'll be followed by Megan, um, after which we will invite questions from the audience and would welcome you to either, you can either um, write a comment or question in the, using the chat function, or, we, or you can actually you can use a raise your hand function and speak directly to Sabina and Megan. We just ask you, um, as a courtesy, to mute your video and audio during the presentations. Finally, if you, um, would like to tweet about today's seminar, we'd ask you to tag us at Sheffield MRG um, in any tweets that you any tweets you post during or after the seminar. Okay, so I will now hand over to Sabina, who will begin with her presentation. Thank you, Sabina. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Thank you for having me today. I realise it's getting very close to Christmas and people probably have better things to do with their lunch times. Hopefully not rushing out and, and trying to, to fit in a million presents in, in whatever short amount of time. Um, I'm very conscious that these seminars ride really, their success I think rides on opportunities for discussion 
Um, and I'm really looking forward to listening to Megan later. So I will try and be fairly brief in my presentation because I know what Megan will be talking about, but it's absolutely worth um, making space for as well as having the, the discussion space later on. So the title of today's session, Multilingual Classrooms as a Social Justice Issue. I'm keen to explore where we are, I guess, on this sliding scale of putting, paying lip service to, to multilingualism in the form of multilingual welcome signs at the school doors to actually fully embedding children's uh, language abilities in day-to-day -day teaching and enabling them to draw on all their languages. So today I'll be looking a bit historically at um, where things started, where, how things are going, and then, as Rebecca said, I'll be talking a bit about the Lost Worlds project, which is trying to do its bit, I guess, to contribute to the idea of multilingual classrooms as a social justice issue. So, oh, this is interesting. This quote did not run off the page um, in my slide, so that is that is weird. Um, let me just see there. That's better. It was a guess when, but I don't know why the first slide ran off. But I've, I've removed the the jeopardy now. This quote: um, "Immigrants, children, attainment, and test is not only related to language, but also several other issues." And famously, no child should be expected to cast off the language and culture of the home as he crosses the school threshold, nor to live and act as though school and home represent two totally separate and different cultures which have to be kept firmly apart. This is from the Bullock Report, which is a governmental document, a policy document from 1975. So in 1975, the Bullock Report, if anybody has the time to, to wade through a good 150 pages, I think, of really helpful discussions of how multilingual children could be supported. Um, it, it's worth reading, but then I guess it's worth looking at where we are with that today. So the idea of supporting multilingual children in the classroom isn't new, but unfortunately, as many governmental drives do, they, they sort of go in peaks and troughs. Um, they, they have their moment and then focus is lost. But actually, we are at the point now, again, where researchers for certain and activists are arguing that looking at multilingualism um, and what that means has become one of the most pressing educational concerns um, for the 21st century. And this is exactly what, what I want to be talking about from a social justice perspective, because I think we have moved to the point where we are aware that multilingualism has moved beyond the fact we know that guest children are multilingual. We are also aware that it is a skill set. It is a bonus. It's not necessarily always viewed like that in, in uh, the schooling context, but it is more than that, actually. I would argue that children having their languages recognised and promoted and um, assisted with facilitated is a right that they have, and that would make it a social justice issue. And to look at why I think that, um, I want to have a look at where we are now um, in terms of the number of children. So we have one in five pupils are first or second generation uh, immigrants or children from a migrant background, and those numbers are increasing. We're still awaiting the details from the 2021 census, but we are at the point where one in five pupils in our schools are registered as having English as an additional language. And there are more pupils than have English. More pupils have English as an additional language than those that are registered. So actually that number is higher, which actually makes multilingual pupils, if you group all languages together, the largest individual minority that our pupils um, represent. So that makes it immediately a very pressing concern. However, language is still predominantly treated as a deficit model. So pupils who are multilingual are problem children. I put this in, in case you can't see, air quotation marks. They are problem children if they cannot meet the curriculum needs. But as soon as they can, the multilingual aspect of their identity more or less becomes invisible. 
So multilingualism is only ever presented as a problem. If they don't speak English well enough, it's a problem. But if they do, it, the multilingualism isn't necessarily always enhanced as a skill set. And instead, it is it is just becomes invisible. And I've got some real examples from pupils about that later on. And this is partially, this is not a teacher bashing. Teachers face enormous pressures of what they have to fit into the curriculum. And these curriculum pressures often dictate a focus on English rather than exploring the full linguistic repertoire. And we are uncovering um, issues in, in teacher training, for example, which makes teachers not feel particularly confident in embedding multilingual practices in their classroom either. This against the backdrop of multilingual language qualifications being cut. Um, so opportunities to get GCSEs and A-levels in heritage languages. And that means that most heritage language education now takes place in community schools. So actually, unlike what Bullock said in the 1975 report, it's not that their multilingual languages, are, their, their multiple languages are welcome in school, it is that they actually go to a completely separate space, a community school, to have their languages supported. And there is a lot of amazing work happening with various foundations, and Megan has got a beautiful video later on to share. Um, but this is not recognised in formal national policy. And as such, um, again, I would argue that it needs recognising and fighting for as a social justice issue. Very briefly, um, early years practitioners in particular will have, will have heard of the funds of knowledge approach, which is the idea that children bring their cultural values, customs, belief, etc. into formal education contexts. And language is, is one aspect of that, but language and culture, of course, are very closely related. And that brings with it both advantages and, and disadvantages. Zippin talks about dark funds of knowledge. We need to acknowledge that the experiences pupils bring from home are not always positive. Um, I have worked with, with schools, and Megan will know again a lot more about this, where children from refugee backgrounds are sharing knowledge that they have um that is isn't your happy clappy you know everybody bring a pizza because it's italian week but actually is is very disturbing very deep funds of knowledge but that still need acknowledging um and again language can come with positive negative experiences connotations etc so it's not a value-free um area this this idea of integrating multilingualism in the classroom. So I've, meant, I've mentioned I would have a few quotes. On the left-hand side is that block quote again, no child should be expected. And on the right-hand side are three separate quotes from my own research, from different research projects. So one boy in year six um, had gone through six years in the same school, but nobody knew that he spoke Hungarian at home. In a different project, I was working with children on their multilingual reading experiences and None of the children were telling me about their reading experiences in languages other than English. They only told me about their experiences of reading in English until I finally asked, as researchers never try to do, a very leading question. Of, but do you read in any other languages? Uh, which led one child to say, well, I read all the Harry Potter books in Bengali, but why do you want to know about that? Nobody wants to know about that. This was a year four child who in year four had read all the Harry Potter books in English as well, but she'd also read them in Bengali, but had already decided at the tender age of nine um, that school would not be interested in that as an achievement or anything else. And then the final quote is from a parent, it would never occur to me to write what we read in Slovak into my daughter's reading diary. For those that are unfamiliar with the practice, in primary schools in particular, children often uh, get a reading diary where parents are expected to write down what the child reads at home. And um, until I myself had the experience of being told not to include our German family reading in the reading diary by the school, um, I hadn't thought that this was an issue. And since my own experience, I have made it a part of all my research projects, since they tend to be about home school um, exchange around multilingualism, of asking parents 
whether they write the reading in the home in, in the whether they write reading in the home language into the reading diary and the answers are incredibly diverse and very often it is something that when i talk to teachers is their immediate oh moment because it's the it's the very first easiest thing that a school can do to actively promote multilingualism to essentially let parents know yes write in the home language and i'm pleased to say that over the last three years or so, it has become much more common for schools to actively encourage that. So there is change happening, which is, which is nice. Families have got an awful lot of reasons for maintaining the heritage language. And part of my work is looking into the emotional as well as the pragmatic reasons for this and ensuring that whatever the reason, um, these reasons are, are valued. Um, and I'll just briefly give an example here. This is I'm not not expecting anybody to read this graphic at the moment, but if anybody wants to follow it up, there is a reference there. Um, but this includes this this framework includes aspects of well, the heritage language is daily life. Our family can only survive if the heritage language is spoken by the child. For example, if you have a parent who does not speak English, and in those instances, it's often not questioned. That the child would learn the heritage language because it is is necessary for pragmatic essential reasons um like as, as it is here it is it is necessary whereas on the other hand if it is necessary for emotional reasons for example because either the parent or the child has has strong emotional reasons that is often less well explored but again over recent times it, it has become more common and this is where when rebecca introduced me she was talking about links between multilingualism identity and belonging um, and well-being is is part of that so parents are often caught between school expectations and the hopes they have for the heritage language and part of my work is to look into that so reasons to support the the heritage language in the classroom are partially exactly what Bullock was talking about, illustrate that all aspects of the child are, are welcome, um, show that schools are welcoming beyond the multilingual welcome sign at the door, and giving children the tools to learn with, with all their skills, rather than ultimately trying to learn with one hand tied behind their back. And for those who might have to make the case um, with senior management or elsewhere, it is actually part of the British values um, to explore other languages and cultures as such that might offer opportunities. So it is actually also really, really clever if children are able to use their home language to explore language and puzzle out content. So one easy way for, to integrate this would be, for example, to enable children to have a working out box or a sheet for, for scribbling notes in all their languages before they answer um, a question. Then again, this encourages communication about all languages and that facilitates understanding around differences in grammar, structure, and ultimately, helps all children develop better language awareness. And I've just given on the right hand side here an example from, from Chinese, where Jin Jian Tian Shi Han Hao, today whether very good, would be the literal translation. And there's, there's no verb there, there's no spacing between words, there's no definite or indefinite articles, and time tends to come first in the sentence. In German, on the other hand, the verb always comes second, and you wouldn't get a sentence without a verb, by the by. But what I'm trying to say is, for teachers to have an awareness of some basic language rules, but especially for children to be given the skills to understand how their different languages work in relation to each other, rather than just telling them, this is what you're doing wrong. If you're saying, you, this, is, this, is, this is where you are going wrong because your home language hasn't got a definite or indefinite article, but English does, that is much more helpful for the child to actually develop their own tools. So briefly, I want to say a little bit about the Lost Worlds project. Um, the link there is at the bottom. And if anybody wants to send me a note about it to, to talk in more detail, I'd be very, very happy to. 
the activities on there are all linked to the national curriculum and they all have a slant towards nature conservation and sustainability with lesson plans and resources freely available and i think at the moment at the last count there are about 22 different activities and again megan will be saying more about the schools of sanctuary work you can use i will briefly mention this the lost world activities on the journey of becoming a school of sanctuary as part of the school's evidence of being being welcoming and and uh, to children from a variety of backgrounds i wanted to share just a few examples and um, here was a a label a mini beast activity where one child did this in four different languages three of them spoken at home and then one added just for the fun of it so it encourages children to bring all their languages we call this a repertoire approach to languages new understanding of multilingualism shows us that multilingual people don't have different pots of languages they don't have an english pot a german pot a chinese pot and they dive into whichever pot is necessary instead they have one pot with all the languages inside and a big mush and however they use whatever they use at the time is part of their repertoire to engage in contexts meaningfully um, and the other thing to be aware of is obviously uh, that depending on the child the home language or english might be stronger but either can usefully be utilized in order to showcase knowledge and understanding and then finally if, if parents can be brought on board um, or dictionary skills developed then actually this can be used to help children develop literacy skills across all languages so just highlighting a few of the activities um, we had a 30 days world multilingual again i'm not quite sure why my headings are wrong because they're not on my notes but anyway um, so here are just some examples where we had daily little activities that would only take a few minutes each time there's three different ones here um, one that is an example of how we would post it on on twitter with the with the ladybird there and then some examples from different schools that were engaging with the activities and taking part in them and this again are really straightforward ways allowing children to to integrate their languages into their learning there are longer more involved activities uh, such as a river of reading which is a, a chronological approach to children exploring how their reading has developed since birth, actually, not just from a skills perspective, but what books they enjoyed, what books were important. And I did one study where I was working with children from migration backgrounds and found that actually children from migration backgrounds have got far, far more complex reasons for choosing books to include in the river of reading, for what they represented in terms of identity, belonging, representation, but also books that were chosen to travel with them on migration journeys. So again, this is a fascinating activity that I'd be happy to talk to anybody more about um, if they're interested. So some short-term goals for schools, again, um, facilitate inclusion of books in read at home diaries, making children aware that their language knowledge is welcome um, and again, on the Lost Worlds website, there are many starter activities that can be used um, for, for the register or as a starter activity. To embed multilingualism into storytelling, shared reading. So when, when books are shared, actually asking, how would you say this in, in the various languages? How many languages can you pull together within the class? And encouraging children to use all their languages to work things out and simply integrating multilingualism into praise and saying, oh, well, you know, I hear you speak Arabic at home. That's, that's awesome. That's, one, that's a start. So these are short-term goals. These are things that schools can start tomorrow. And then slightly on a longer term, um, starting a multilingual library, a display board, integrating multilingualism into award systems. Whether or not award systems are necessarily a good idea is a different conversation. But if a school already has an award system and is giving out awards for sports and maths, et cetera, then maybe having one or several around multilingualism um, to show that this is also valued 
um, would be a good idea. Communicate the commitment to multilingualism to parents and enabling staff training and parent information sessions so that teachers feel confident in integrating multilingualism. I have got a slide of feedback uh, from teachers and children, but Megan has got a film, which is much nicer than reading a lot of quotes. So I'm going to gloss over this. Um, but here's one brief, again, the Bullock quote on the right hand side. And here on the left hand side, this is from a school that did the Rivers of Reading exercise. Um, and I'll briefly read it out if for, for anybody um, struggling visually. It was a real eye to hear from children who had never before spoken about their home lives, but by delving into their reading lives, we were able to bring together languages spoken at home and school. So again, as an activity, this wasn't, uh, this wasn't particularly tricky to implement. Um, and I finish by returning to the Bullock Report, um, where again, even in 1975, these children are genuine bilinguals, but this fact is often ignored or unrecognized by schools. Their bilingualism is of great importance to the children and the families, and also to society as a whole. In a linguistically conscious nation in the modern world, we should see it as an asset, as something to be nurtured, and one of the agencies which should nurture it is the school. And the addendum there is mine, because otherwise, as I found in my research, children will continue to self-edit their identity, assuming that there is a part of them that nobody wants to know about. And I would hope we would like to avoid that. Thank you, that's me. Thank you, Sabina. Thank you very much. Um, I would now like to hand over to, to Megan. Thank you, Megan. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Let me just get my um, presentation up. And I hope you can all see it really well. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to come and talk a little bit about um, a subject that's very close to my heart um, and also be able to kind of explain a little bit more about the Schools of Sanctuary Network and highlight some of the amazing practice that's happening um, within some of the schools um, with regards to promoting multilingualism. Um, so to really quickly start off, um, I actually work for City of Sanctuary UK, which is a really small um, UK wide charity that works within this much wider national movement um, about welcome and belonging for people who come to the UK seeking safety, seeking sanctuary, seeking respect. So namely, um, people who come here seeking asylum or people come, who come here as refugees. So there's two main things that City of Sanctuary UK does. Um, one thing that we do is we work as an umbrella organisation um, for a wide network of about 115 local groups and partner organisations that are spread across the UK that work to promote welcome in their local area. Um, and we support them with offering resources, guidance, advice, and networking opportunities. The other thing we do is through our sanctuary streams and sanctuary awards, which I'm gonna focus on mostly today. And this is where we um, recognize organiza organizations and institutions um, within a shared field of practice um, that have made effort to make their setting a, a place of welcome and inclusion for people seeking sanctuary. Now, of course, one of these streams is the Schools of Sanctuary stream. Um, so in brief, a School of Sanctuary is a place of welcome. It is a place where everyone within that school setting has learned about um, issues relating to migration and why people seek sanctuary in the UK and their experiences once they've arrived. A School of Sanctuary recognizes that migration is a positive thing and new arrivals enrich us. And it also makes sure that all students within that community, particularly students from sanctuary seeking backgrounds, um, are seen, supported and effectively included. So a school can become a school of sanctuary by going through these, these three main processes, which are actually the processes any organisation um, that is recognised with a City of Sanctuary um, award um, must go through. But for a school, this means that um, the school needs to learn about what it means to be seeking sanctuary and how to effectively support those um, who are within the school community. Um, it needs to embed policies and practices that ensure welcome, safety and inclusion um, is 
intertwine very intimately into the school ethos and school practice and daily life. And they also need to make sure that they share this vision of welcome on all of their efforts that they have done um, with the wider community. I mean, I think we all know that schools are often very much at the center of their communities. And so they have this really powerful reach if they start talking about what they've learned and the things they do, they can really, you know, connect with people who perhaps are not already, not already thinking about um, the experiences of people sinking sanctuary, but I'll, I'll touch on this in a little bit later. So the Schools of Sanctuary Network has been around for about 10 years um, and it first emerged in Yorkshire, in fact, um, but it kind of developed quite organically and um, it was quite slow at the beginning and it's only really in the past few years that we've brought it together, made the whole process a little bit more formalized have this minimum have we now have eight minimum criteria which come under those learn embed and share processes and um, in doing so it means that you know a school that goes through the process in Brighton have a very quite a similar experience to a school going through the process in Sheffield or in a valley in Wales for example we currently have a network of 331 schools in England Wales and Northern Ireland um, we've yet to crack Scotland um, but we do have about 150 schools working towards recognition in the next year, including finally a couple of schools in Scotland. So that's really exciting. And we support the Schools of Sanctuary Network with guidance, advice, resources, um, webinars, um, and various different opportunities. Um, for example, recently we hosted a webinar with Refugee Education UK, um, which was about supporting newly arrived Afghan students in schools, which was really well received actually. So, um, and it's a, there's recordings on our website, so please feel free to go and have a look. I think that schools of sanctuary have never been more important. And indeed we've had kind of unprecedented interest in the past year, which has been really lovely to see um, and, and kind of see that other people realize how important um, this, this work is. Obviously, the global context, we have um, the highest numbers of um, people who've been forcibly displaced in history. Yet, I think it's really important we remember that people throughout history have moved. This is not a new phenomena at all. And, um, you know, these numbers are often sensationalized quite negatively in the press, certainly in the national context. Um, we see this a lot in the headlines, in the media and so on. And this is kind of supported and enabled by the hostile environment that the government has um, imposed. Um, and even more so, obviously, with the uh, new plan for immigration that was passed by the House of Commons yesterday, unfortunately. So Schools of Sanctuary um, has a really powerful potential impact for the community by raising awareness um, about the experiences of people seeking sanctuary. We can combat misinformi misinformation and inaccurate rhetoric. I think, um, you know, especially when children are going home and talking to parents who perhaps have been reading the newspaper, they're much more inclined to listen to their own children um, than to you and me talking about these issues. So I think there's a really powerful impact there. On the individual level, as um, Sabine kind of touched on earlier, um, there is largely an absence of guidance um, at the national level in terms of policy for schools to develop um, effective policy and practice. Um, to support students from sanctuary seeking backgrounds. This is different in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. We're, we're not so great in England at the moment. But because of this, there are often schools that um, lack the expertise um, or the knowledge um, to effectively meet the needs of students from these backgrounds. Um, and so by becoming a school of sanctuary, they can use it as a vehicle for whole school improvement in this way. At the same time, there are schools that have a very long history of um, working with students from um, sanctuary seeking backgrounds and their efforts that kind of go above and beyond the minimum expectations should be recognized and celebrated. And that's what the award does for them. So <laughs> where does multilingualism come into this? Um, well, I think multilingualism is vitally important for schools of sanctuary. Um, on the one hand, you know, it meets the needs of students seeking sanctuary, as, as Sabine's already touched on. Um, and, on. And something that she didn't ex mention yet, but I hope to discuss with her after the presentation, is that I think it, by promoting multilingualism in school, it actually has a really powerful impact for the students who are monolingual um, uh, English speakers. One thing that I've heard about, you know, we have those set phrases, oh, speak English, go back to your country, 
Whereas if students in school are surrounded by all the different languages, suddenly this kind of phrase doesn't need to be used because they recognize that multilingualism is normal, is, is very widespread and actually, you know, being monolingual in our, often is, is, is the minority in that way. Um, and so for students from sanctuary seeking backgrounds, by promoting multilingualism, we recognize their skills um, and their prior knowledge. And by making sure that it's included within the school community, they are, they are represented, There's their lang lang linguistic backgrounds are represented and so are often their cultural backgrounds. So I kind of wanted to share um, a few examples from schools within our networks and who have done some really great work. So um, the first one is St Mary the Virgin Primary School in Cardiff. Um, and many thanks to Becky Baston, who shared some of this information with me um, from that school. Um, so they have 18 languages in their school community and about 83% of the students um, have English as an additional language. Now, school practice, we have the multilingual posters and signs that's been touched on. They also make an effort to, um, to employ teaching assistants who speak um, languages that are very predominant in the school community. But I think the thing that I particularly loved um, was um, their assemblies. Um, so they have a weekly whole school assembly where at the beginning of the ceremony, at the assembly, every single person in the school community says welcome in all of the 18 languages that is spoken in the school community. Um, and as Becky mentioned, when I was speaking to her, the assemblies are now getting quite long. Um, but I, she thinks it's a really important thing and, and students really love teaching, you know, that one word to the rest of the um, students in, and staff in, in school. And it means that at least everyone can say one word in, in the other people's language. The other thing is that they have um, at the beginning of the assembly, they also do a school prayer because it is a faith school and um, it started obviously with a Christian prayer in English, but now they also do the prayer and um, I believe in Welsh um, and they have um, a Muslim prayer in Arabic and most recently um, a student who's Hindu asked to come and do her prayer in her own language and um, so I think that's really a beautiful example. But um, I will let the students speak for themselves if that's okay. So let me just show you this video um, that the wonderful Becky Baston um, shared with me. Um, where am I? So if I go on to this, um, I hope you can see it. Please let me know if you can't hear. Trish, how does it make you feel when we use lots of languages in school? Um, it makes me feel happy because, like, so if I don't understand the language, um, uh, then someone else might understand it, and it helps us all understand each other, and then we all get along. How do you feel when you hear your own language being spoken in worship? Um, I feel happy because um, in not many people speak um my language in school so when I hear it I'm like oh it's I feel happy because like I didn't know that they understand it and it makes me feel welcome. Is it useful to hear lots of languages around school? Yeah. How would you feel if you only ever heard English in school? Um if it would it wouldn't be a problem because we know English, but for some people they have to learn English and if there's someone who can translate in their language to English, they understand what it is, because if they don't understand it, they don't know what it what it means. <laughs> Nika, how do you feel when you hear lots of languages around school? I feel um, like that everyone's welcomed and yeah, and I feel happy as well. And when you hear your own language, how does that make you feel? Um, that makes me feel welcomed and like that um, they know my language because not really much people are Turkish here. So um, when I hear um, my language spoken, I'm like, oh, oh that's my language and yeah. What is useful about having lots of languages spoken? 
if like someone like for example like they came from a different country not knowing english well um in the assembly greetings it might be their um language and they'll be like oh i know what that means It goes on for a little bit longer, but I will stop there for now and go back to my presentation so I can touch on um, the secondary school that I was hoping to talk about. Um, so the other example I was wanting to talk about was this school in Leeds. I'm afraid I can't um, identify it by name because I was unable to get it greenlit by the marketing team at the Multi Academy Trust it's in. Um, but um, again, it's a very diverse school. They have 66 nationalities, 71 first languages they've identified. Um, I know that about 73% of the students um, speak English as an additional language, um, but about 45% of those um, are new to English. Um, so in terms of school practice, they offer a um, student um, interpreter course where students can be um, accredited as interpreters and, and buddies to support new arrivals in schools. Um, they also um, offer as many GCSE heritage languages as they can. I think that, obvious, that often um, averages out about 40 um, students getting GCSE heritage languages each year in about 14 languages. Um, and the EAL coordinator asked me to stress that they would love to do more, but that's just as many as they can do um, that are allowed and um, that's possible at the moment. Um, they also um, regularly do student voice sessions in students' first, um, first languages. Um, so I was recently present for a um, student voice session for Arabic speaking students. And, and one of the things that they, they indeed stressed was the importance and the value they felt they got um, doing the GCSE heritage language um, exams in terms of, you know, for the students who were more newly arrived, they could get um, a very high grade in a, in, a, in a subject, whereas they might struggle across other subjects. Um, and for the, the students who'd been here for a much longer time, they wanted to be, um, they felt that by doing that exam, they were you know, recognized for having developed and sustained um, their language skills in another language. Um, they've also recently um, started employing tutors to support in, who speak um, students' first languages to support and um, help students become familiar with the GCSE exam. Um, in after school sessions. So I think they're trying to employ um, tutors in all of the, the languages that they, they offer heritage language GCSEs in, which is, I think, a really amazing example. Um, and finally, the EAL coordinator is trying to um, help the rest of the staff realize the value of promoting, enabling, and supporting multilingualism in the classroom. I think at times, staff are very nervous about allowing it, thinking that you know, students should be speaking in English at all times. And um, you know, by speaking in other languages, they might be being disruptive. And, and the EAL, EAL coordinator is really trying to push back against that um, and change that understanding. So the couple of things that jumped out at me when I was thinking about this is, um, for schools to promote multilingualism, they need to learn about the value of promoting multilingualism in schools um, and the ways to do so. But they also need to unlearn those biases. And um, many, unfortunately, I think we all have, um, especially um, British people towards um, you know, speaking other languages um, and familiarity with hearing different languages in classroom and things like that. I think schools need to embed, um, you know, regular opportunities to recognize and include um, multilingual, multilingual activities in the school community. And they need to share students' multilingual skills um, with the wider school community and really celebrate um, their, their expertise in that way. Um, so, if you want any more information about Schools of Sanctuary, I've included um, some links here and I can, I can share these um, with um, Sabine and Rebecca to make sure that they get to everyone. Um, but that's all on my side. Um, I think my, the thing that really stood out for me um, whilst I was um, thinking of this presentation was the fact that you know, all of the schools that I just mentioned now are very diverse schools. And I think it is much harder um, in contexts where perhaps the language communities within the school and um, student body are less visible. S schools don't think about embracing it. And so I was wondering, Sabine, if you have any examples where they, schools have done that effectively in, in settings like that, or, or how these schools could do so, I suppose. 
Yeah, thanks, Megan. I think that's a really valid point. And I think especially if I think of Sheffield in particular, which has very um, urban and very rural areas. And as a result, I've worked with Sheffield schools. Um, I will share an example where I had the same research project in two schools and I was working with two classes in each school. It's where the Harry Potter quote earlier came from. And in one school across the two classes, there was only one monolingual child. And in the other school, the most international pupil I found had a Welsh grandmother. And, and that was the most diverse person in the in the classroom. So you are absolutely right. It, it can be much, much trickier, especially in communities that are predominantly white British. Um, and I think what's really interesting is um, that they also I think that they tend to be the more the more rural areas, which quite often are also working class. Um, so they're not necessarily families that are always well traveled, for example. Um, and it, again, in it, I, I know an example of a school that wanted to organize a mosque visit and the parents vetoed it. Um, so I think this is the sort of thing that um, that we're up against, I guess, and in to do a lot of education work with parents, um, with uh, not not so much with teachers. I think with teachers, it's, it's less education work in terms of convincing them, but more about how do we do this. Um, but bringing in, for example, you know, there, there are multilingual theatre companies. There are. It's. I find it really tricky. I've had one school suggest the idea of a cultural exchange with another school in the same city. Um, but I'm very wary of this because I think that has huge potential of leading to othering and, and finger pointing and look at, oh, look how weird they are down there. So I think that could have the opposite effect. So I think it really needs to be a drip feeding, um, but again, a normalizing, not a, oh, it's Diwali, nobody knows what it is, no, but, but, but you know, here's two worksheets on it. And then, uh, oh, now it's Ramadan, here's another worksheet on that. So I think, yeah. Maybe, yeah, is that sort of drip feeding of other languages, other cultures? Um, I suppose you can't you can't create multilingualism, multiculturalism where it does not exist. But I think, especially through the use of media, thinking more from from the schools of sanctuary perspective than necessarily the the lost world's perspective, I guess. Um, I would say that there's there's the use of media to bring in those opportunities recently um little amal came to sheffield and that would have you know that that would have been a great opportunity to bring a school in and use that as a as a learning moment to explore more aspects of migration welcome forced migration etc yeah i completely agree i think i mean i think the one thing is is that i think schools often um assume that there are very limited language communities within the school setting so for example um you know my family are from north yorkshire you know rural very white um you know theoretically i've spoken to schools in those areas where they say you know english is the only language spoken here when actually you know in my family alone we have three french spanish and arabic like you know i think that schools really need to review how they can um find out about the other languages that perhaps the student doesn't speak but perhaps a member of their family speaks to kind of challenge the idea that you know we are a monolingual school community i, I think actually it'd be really rare to find that whether it is yeah. like you know a grandma who speaks welsh or um i don't know a, a sister who's at university studying french or you know i think there's always those connections and we just really need to lean into them to avoid that othering of other people who speak languages yeah. actually we all should <laughs> and i think that's yeah absolutely and you just again you, you sort of picked up on the other ring that if we make it something desirable um and again i mean you mentioned i think it was a french spanish and arabic um and, you know, they're all big languages and i remember I, I often use the example where um I, so i live in a, in a very white rural area and my son being german for a while was the most multilingual kid at school right. um but there was there was one other who spoke czech 
Um, and I could tell from the way uh, my son came home and then talking to, to this girl's mum that other parents, other kids, other teachers, they knew more what to do with German. You know, they, they knew a German footballer or they knew yeah. a German food or, you know, they'd be, they, they, they knew very little about what to do with Czech. So again, we need to, I guess, make sure that, that, uh, that we avoid this hierarchical system of some languages being viewed as, as more valuable than others. And I guess, again, there could be some real positive work being done in saying, you know, oh, so, so how many different languages can we, you know, what, what would you like to learn how to say welcome in or hello, yeah. et yeah. cetera. And I mean, again, I remember as a kid, I had, I had a weird phase where I was desperate to learn Swahili. I, I think I'd read a book mm -hmm. and I decided that was, that was it. That was what I was going to learn. Um, and it predated the internet. So <laughs> I was a bit in a small town in Germany. I was somewhat, you know, it was a bit hopeless, but it's to, to, I guess, do everything we can to help children embrace that quite natural curiosity that they have certainly, a, you know, a, a, at the beginning of their educational journey and if we don't close those doors through through curriculum pressures but instead try and open them as much as we can that'd be good yeah i think one thing is is that we really need to move as well if possible but honestly i'm not sure how away from these moments of multilingualism to yes. it fully being you know consistent embedded practice in in classrooms because you know i do i think it is a really great first step having you know uh, these activities these different opportunities to embrace it but actually what's most needed is when you are studying the tudors or um you know the water cycle having those that those practices in in the classroom and, and students very accustomed to it. I think, you know, kids would pick it up pretty quickly, yep. um, especially yeah. if it was done every day. But I think for teachers, as you kind of touched on earlier with the initial teacher training and so on and so forth, often they don't feel um, empowered to, to do so, don't really know where to start. And, and I think that's probably one of the biggest, biggest challenges for getting it involved in schools for sure. Yeah, and for definite, I mean, again, I think there is a difference in, in I don't know, I guess, encouraging a sort of generic feeling of, of welcome and really giving children sort of the multilingual tools. Um, yeah. But for the latter, um, what we try to do with the Lost Worlds project is that even though the activities are around specific aspects, so for example, the label a mini beast, mm. um, whether you label a mini beast or you label a water cycle, um the, the, you know the pedagogical aspect of it is exactly the same so uh, and it gets harder because just like you know children label a mini beast and you go leg foot whatever um by the time you have to label photosynthesis um <laughs> yeah you know, it gets it gets trickier but children can then grow with that challenge and say oh, actually i'm going to look this up and to see what it is in my in my other language um and and grow with it and grow with that challenge so hopefully yeah if it does become normalized then there is a real opportunity without teaching home languages to facilitate children to to grow the, all their languages in line with their education yeah i've just seen rebecca's comment we're just nattering here if anybody else would like to <laughs> <laughs> like to come in Yes, hello. Just to say, yes, it is. it's a really, really interesting conversation, such an interesting topic and seeing how um, and seeing the the way I don't know it, the, the relationship between between the Lost Worlds project and multilingualism and also the schools of sanctuary. I um, will wait and see if if anybody just wanted to make a comment or raise their hand and ask a question, please do so. Um, I suppose what we you've touched on this a little bit, but I think um, it's you know the think about the benefits I think because often as you've talked about children that whose English language ability is seem to be in deficit that's an issue that is dealt with outside rather than outside the, the main classroom what do you you know what are some of the advantages of um, multilingual classrooms on on monolingual children but but beyond their like language awareness and knowledge I mean you touched on some of this but it'd be really interesting to hear you expand on it in terms of what the kind of 
you know, the longer term benefits on, on particular mono, monolingual children. Yeah, I think um, you've, you've mentioned a few and I think Megan again also talked a little bit about, um, I think on monolingual children, the fact is that we do not live in a monolingual, monocultural society and to create schools that pretend to be um, ultimately do not equip our children to grow and flourish in such a society. And the other thing is that I think um, schools often, or rather maybe, maybe parents, I don't know, I think in the UK there is a, a general assumption that if you're born in the UK you'll stay in the UK, whereas yeah. I think internationally that is not necessarily so. I mean I wasn't born in the UK um, and I could easily imagine moving somewhere else again, but I think the UK has a very static assumption of, of the world and the workplace and that just isn't the case anymore. So as well, so an openness of engaging with languages, we always think that um, if you learn, you know, there's, there's a big discussion of which language to learn. So in hmm. primary school, there is an entitlement to learn a language and schools in the ages think, oh, should it be Spanish, should it be French, should it be whatever, but actually what is important is general linguistic ability if you understand how language works you get the tools to pick up languages and if you later decide to move to the netherlands or to japan it doesn't matter if you actually grow up with an understanding of as i said in that little example of chinese oh actually yes yeah, some languages don't have verbs some languages you know have, have certain clauses that explain this that and the other some use lots of metaphors all of that will help you ultimately to unpuzzle both your own language and any language that you encounter in your future to actually make it a bit easier to, to engage with that. Mm -hmm. I suppose one of the challenges is rousing the curiosity of teachers, isn't it, in language, which I think you touched on a bit. It's them being interested and curious about language rather than fearful of other languages spoken in the classroom that they don't necessarily understand. Okay, I'm going to ask, um, invite Melanie, if you would like to um, ask a question, please, if you want to use your audio and your camera as you choose. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for the amazing talk from both of you. It's been really refreshing to hear it, and I feel like it's a conversation that is talked about more. Um, from my own experiences, I finished teaching and I went into an education research role in a council. So I work with City of Sanctuary actually as well. And we're setting up refugee integration projects, which is something that I'm working on alongside education. And the problem that I'm facing is the promoting multilingualism in classrooms. And I'd like to say thank you, Megan, for raising that and you know talking about that. Because I've never heard anyone else other than me and my colleagues talk about it. And it is it's interesting because I grew up in this area and people like students called me exotic for speaking Spanish. I was the only non only non do you mean I was the most only bilingual student in the school and I, I really want that to change and it feels like even though you know I'm in my 20s now things haven't changed that much and it's such a rural area that change doesn't really happen so it's finding that like you said Sabine that drip feed method of slowly integrating things in. And I wondered if you had any advice on that and promoting that multilingualism. I mean, I have the ability to, I'm currently designing um, CPD for teachers to promote multilingualism. And you mentioned parents. Is there any other ways that we could do it? Yeah. Um... I mean, I think we, we sort of know each other from Twitter and, and email, so if it, I'm, I'm very happy to talk some more, but ultimately I would say there are various, um, for example, multilingual storytelling videos available online. I might also look into um, helping stock school libraries with books. If, I mean, if nobody in the school speaks a language other than English, but I would look at books in translation so books that were originally authored in other languages and translated into English and maybe make a little display board and say, look, in the original language, 
this is what that book looked like. And in the original, this is what that book looked like. Um, and grow, again, the sort of language awareness on the, on the Lost Worlds project, one of the activities we have is Guess the Mini Beast. And I've translated, or we, we've looked up translations of various mini beasts. Um, so, and presented them in the original script and also in translation. So in Thai, for example, a caterpillar is a butterfly worm. So it presents various meanings and, and then essentially says, guess the mini beast. Can you work out from seeing this? What, what, what is the name of this mini beast? And so actually to decide that a butterfly worm is a caterpillar, not only applies linguistic knowledge, but it also applies knowledge of biology. So it's very much curriculum related either way. And those sorts of things can be very easily integrated on lots and lots of different levels. Um, and we've had a school run that as a starter activity for, an, for a whole school assembly. Um, and it's, it's, it is one of my favorite activities because it's so quick, um, but really engages the kids with actually puzzling out other words, and, but also seeing scripts. Um, and we have um, calligram activities where you have an outline of an animal and then the name of the animal in lots of different languages at the bottom. And the children are encouraged to fill in the shape with words about that animal. So for, for a bat, you might use echolocation, flight, night, but also the words at the bottom. So again, they get the opportunity to experiment with different scripts, different translations, and they might look at something and go, well, actually, the, the Italian and the Spanish one look really similar. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> and they start working out lang you know, links between different languages. So those are just a couple of quick ideas, but I think, yeah, there are quite a few. Thank you. Can Thank I? You so uh, do you want to add anything, Megan, before I before I invite Magdalena to ask a question? I, I was just going to say, when it comes to you know um, encouraging schools or explaining the benefit, I think this, we should obviously recognise the importance for multilingual students, but also I do think that the the potential and the importance for monolingual students is so important. It is so important. So, I mean, one thing that I always think about is that, you know, often um, people from the UK are not very confident speaking in other languages. We've seen, you know, decreasing interest in students taking um, second languages at GCSE, at A-level and things like that. And I think the problem is, is because we're not getting that interest and getting people's comfort with speaking other languages at a younger age. We need children to be able to explore and play and have fun with different languages to feel comfortable making mistakes so that when they get to year nine and they have to start preparing for their GCSE and suddenly they start getting real worried and making some mistakes in you know whatever language that might be they've already had years and years and years of playing with languages of feeling comfortable making mistakes I think that's why you know as uh, countries we're not very good at it because we've not had that experience in school and so, yes, there's the benefit for multilingual students, but absolutely for, for monolingual students as well. And the, you know, long term, that'll stop, that'll slow the, the narrative of, you know, you're in this country, you must speak English, you know, it'll, it'll have that impact as well. So, yeah, I, I hope that's touched on something. <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Megan. Um, can I, thank you, Melanie, for your question. Can I um, invite Magdalena? to ask a question. Hi Magdalena, are you, are you there? Um, okay, um, I'll, uh, Magdalena do you want to, did you want to ask a question or we can raise your hand again if, if you wish to continue. Um, I was just going to ask, it seems to me that you talked a lot about the practice, the kind of changes to practice in schools and what can be done and, you know, in relation to any school sanctuary status in relation to the lost world activities. What about some of the kind of policy change that need to take place in order to really think about embedding multilingualism and kind of a, and really extending um, this practice across schools in the UK? What, what would you like to see happen in, in an ideal world? I think there definitely needs to be more initial teacher training. I think that teachers don't feel confident um, uh, 
um, recognizing multilingualism in school. They don't know how to if the topic isn't language like overtly language related. So I think it needs to start uh, ICT. But um, yeah, I mean, there is just such an absence of any guidance or advice for schools that anything encouraging schools to use multilingualism, I think would be really helpful. But I'm sure Sabine could add, add more detail on that. No, sadly, be long, long, be beyond a long wish list, um, I haven't <laughs> got much to add because um, I think both, both Megan and Rebecca, you're absolutely right. For something to have lasting permanent change and not be dependent on individual teachers, individual schools that recognize a need and and often it is a case of individual teachers driving something, but then they move and yeah. and a school is is struggling to maintain that guidance, that drive. Um, so it is a case of yeah, improving teacher training um, and ultimately lobbying. Part of my work, I spent a long time trying to influence from the top down, but realized that actually, I think I now believe that the only way a policy change might be achieved is bottom up. That if we have schools that show that it can be done successfully, we might be so. For example, I've started talking to Sheffield City Council to work more embedded with teacher training and teach well, CPD, continued professional development. Um, and from I think, yeah, ultimately it's a case of proving proving not only the need, but proving that it works and proving that it doesn't, sadly, that's a need, that it doesn't detract from a school's performance yeah. on the things that are currently valued. Because um, I think every every teacher very rightly asks, what 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 will I end up not doing if I do this? You know, where 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 will I fall short? Are there any because the, the, the curriculum is so packed, um, and I've just seen uh, that Magdalena has been typing. Yes. So yeah. So Magdalena has added it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Magdalena. I'm sorry you're having problems with your audio. Um, so just to um, Magdalena wanted to um, build on Melanie's question to be in response about strategies that classrooms can incorporate. Um, and by uh, by engaging parents and children and creating bilingual picture books for children's learning whilst raising awareness of different languages in the community. So it seems that Magdalena's comment is about which kind of builds on something I was going to ask is about how how multilingual classrooms can bridge the gap or kind of promote the inclusion not just of children, pupils, but obviously parents, carers, and families um, in education. So I, I have. A, a nice example there. I've heard of um, a school that they do, yeah, I mean, you know, weekly story time or whatever, um, and they have a lot of students from sanctuary seeking backgrounds. And I think one of the biggest challenges in a way is helping um, parents who are newly arrived to the country, perhaps don't speak much English themselves, feel comfortable in the school setting and understand what's happening at school and so on and so forth. And one of the things that they've done is that they invite um, a parent to come in and read a story in their own language to the whole class that their, their, their child is in. And I think that's a really great way of, you know, physically getting the parent into school. Obviously, this was kind of like pre-COVID, but um, also, you know, helping that parent feel uh, comfortable speaking in their first language in school, become familiar with the school setting, um, you know, and help it. And even sometimes there's been occasions where you know, when the other students were wanting to know what the meaning of a specific word was. And so the parent's child would then act as an interpreter, helping the other students access it. And I just think that's such an amazing, wonderful moment where they're feeling like, look at that skill there, that they're moving between these two languages and the rest of their peers are reliant on them for that and recognizing that. I just, I thought that was a really wonderful example I heard about. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And just to add, I mean, what Magdalena is talking about in her comment about creating bilingual picture books or just monolingual in a language that is not English um, as well. And the fact because I've done a lot of work, as, as Rebecca said, the introduction on the multilingual children's library and actually the, the creation of an artifact, whether that is a poster that tells a story in, in a language or a mix of languages or a book that might end up in the classroom reading library or the school library. The fact that multilingual artifacts 
created by children and families and parents um, make their way into formal education spaces. So it's not just the sort of transience of language being spoken, but actually the space is being taken over. I think that's really important. And again, sort of similar to what Megan was saying about Aaron coming in and reading a story, if that story could then subsequently be written down and form part of a collection of stories that are held by the school. So either, I don't know, laminated and put on the door or put together in a book that can be photocopied and shared or put up on the website on a special folder. All those things really show that there are tangible, very tangible ways of, of facilitating multilingualism in the school. Thank you. Um, Annetta, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, thank you both. It was really interesting and the, the conversation you had afterwards, it was, I think you could be probably both going for <laughs> much longer. Yeah, so it's nice to see how, how much you're, uh, you know, both uh, invested in the topic. I was thinking a little bit, I'm by my background, Polish person, like, you know, I grew up totally in Poland, but uh, I was, I know a little bit more about uh, probably some of the parents here, how they try to, um, teach their children language and it's quite often through different Sunday schools uh, or like some additional outside school activities and I'm thinking maybe they could there what are, there are different expectations and among different minorities depending on you know on how 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 much support you have also within a family to teach proper English because maybe even if you communicate with children at home I think your original language becomes much poorer when you live long in a country. So I was, th I was thinking it's really difficult because in some schools, as you say, it could be one child. In some schools, you could have a, a larger group of students so you can maybe create some additional activities for them or like even classes in a language so they can take a test or something. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to say what should be the overall guideline for school. Uh, um, if it's at all possible. So I was, I was, I was, the question is a, a little bit um, just around what are from your experience are there different expectations from different ethnic group from parents what schools should do is it something they would prefer it to to have more systematic classes on their language not only you know this more celebration on like some smaller words and welcome welcome words etc or rather there's expectation for the school to embed more the classes on different languages um can this be generalized in any way probably there's different the different perspectives are coming into play what parents and children probably we should children give a voice as well probably uh, what they would expect yeah thank you yeah thank you so interestingly um in sweden for example every child has the right to have formal lessons in their mother language no matter what the language is and all over Sweden um, there is a collection of peripatetic part-time teachers traveling between schools because even if there is just one child speaking Punjabi in a school that child has the right to have formal Punjabi lessons. Um, interestingly whenever I say that to teachers or whenever we ask teachers in England so you know what do you think about formal support for, for language learning so it would be impossible you go, well there's a country that does it um, so, but interestingly, you ask Annetta about parents. I have honestly never had a parent expect formal lessons for their child. Um, and I don't know whether that is a sort of a result of a lowering of expectations over a long and hard battle of living in a country that does not value multilingualism um or whether that is is sort of genuine i have i've worked with many parents who really struggle to support their child's language development and interestingly just as a quick anecdote um over lockdown um heritage language families went one of two ways normally either um the children's home language improved because they spent longer at home and they had more opportunities of speaking the home language or the whole home language uh, community collapsed a bit because parents had to do much more of the formal education and therefore spoke less in the home language and more in English 
foregrounding English even more. So even families where before they had a fairly strict divide of oh, English at school, but our language at home, English invaded the personal home space and therefore became more difficult. So I don't know whether Megan's got anything to add to that. Um, I mean, in terms of, I, I, I agree. I think, I think all um, families, I've yet to find a family that doesn't um, value maintaining their heritage language, their, their cultural language, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think that some families from, from some linguistic backgrounds, that there, are, there is much more provision outside the school setting for quite formal classes. So for example, Arabic language classes, you know, especially in like large urban cities are generally pretty easy to find. Um, and so there is usually like that kind of capacity service of provision available, even if it's not in school. I think I'd agree also families don't expect schools generally to, to offer that. I think again, because it is so niche, very, very few schools do. I, but I do think it's a conversation worth having, you know, actually requiring schools to, to support that because, you know, with resettlement programs, for example, families are being resettled in increasingly very rural, quite isolated places where they may be the only family in that area that speaks that language. And so then accessing those language classes uh, is really difficult. I've heard of families traveling like two, two and a half hours to go to a city on a weekend purely so their children can go to, you know, Arabic language classes and Quranic classes. And so, and is that what we, I mean, in a way that's great because then they can have that community aspect as well with people from the shared cultural background. And I think that's very important when they're so isolated, but should we be expecting them or to travel two and a half hours? I, I, yeah, I, I do think the Swedish model is really interesting, but unfortunately, I think as things stand, the there is very little uh, interest from up top um, to support that or encourage it. And so it is left to, as Sabine said, motivated teachers and schools to, to kind of go that extra mile, which is a shame. I would point out that I do think things are different perhaps in Wales, because they are much more, I mean, as all schools have to have all paperwork now in Welsh and English, they are very much more open to uh, multilingualism and, and much more proactive at supporting it. So I will kind of put that in and hopefully my Welsh colleagues will, will thank, <laughs> appreciate that I mentioned that because I, I appreciate what they do. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have a long way to go in England for sure, especially. Oh, thank you so much. To, I think this is a conversation that could go on so much longer, but we are, we are, we are, we are, we are slightly over time. Thank you. I just want to say an enormous thank you to Sabina and to Megan for today's presentation. It was a really, yeah, it was really, really interesting. And thank you to everyone who's, everyone who's joined us today. Um, we, yeah, we really appreciate you participating in the seminar. I would like to just one final reminder that next week um, is our final seminar of the series um, where we'll be looking um, we looking at the current situation the current humanitarian crisis on the Polish Belarusian border so same time same place next week um, and you can find full details on the website on Twitter there'll be a full recording posted on Twitter once we um, from today's seminar and finally we will be announcing the semester two seminar series in early 2022 so we will be continuing um, throughout the rest of this academic year so thank you so much to everyone and we will hopefully see you next week <laughs>